Pipelines are pretty fundamental in process engineering. Without a pipe, we couldn't move around the substances we are trying to process. While pipeline design is pretty fundamental, at no point did anyone show me how to design a pipeline from scratch. The problems we were given usually involved an existing piping system. So we'd get a sketch of a tank and a couple of pipes and a few elbows, and we'd be asked to calculate the pressure drop in that system. The thing I wanted to do here is show you that we can start with absolutely nothing, make up a problem statement, and then design a pipeline with no special simulation software or any special tools, just using a, a basic spreadsheet. What I'm also going to do is share the spreadsheet. You can check out the link in the video description so you can see exactly what it is that I've done. Disclaimer, it's probably not perfect. You shouldn't use it to go and design your future refinery. Uh, if there are mistakes, point them out and I'll fix them and keep some revision notes. I've got nothing to hide. If I've made a mistake, I also want to know. So I'm going to start by making up a problem. Let's just say I've got a friend who lives two kilometers away from me. And what they've said to me is, Okay, you've got a hell of a lot of water. Why don't you give me some of it? I want 50 tons an hour of that water from you. I say, okay, maybe we can come to some sort of deal. The friend also says that what they require is for this water to be supplied at one bar, which means by the time it reaches their plant, it has to have a pressure of one bar and no less. To make it interesting, we're going to assume that we're going downhill 15 meters. And that's because it always seemed like we're pumping uphill. So I thought we'd try something different. The first thing we do when we do any process design is we define battery limits. Battery limits are designated with this symbol here. The reason battery limits are important is it defines the point in physical space where my responsibility starts and ends and what I need to look out for. So everything up until this point over here, that's my problem. You can see this pressure of one bar is within my battery limit, meaning it's my issue to make sure that it's a minimum of one pressure. What my friend does with that afterwards, that's not my concern. Now you may stop and ask, where's my pump? I've only drawn a line. And I'll say to you, hold on. Our friend has said that they want one bar worth of pressure. The height of a column of water required to get to a pressure of one bar is only 10 meters. We've got 15 meters worth of elevations, so it should be really easy to achieve. So why do we need a pump? Let's find out. So the first thing I've done is set up my fluid parameters over here. We're working with water. We're keeping it at ambient temperature to keep it simple. The density is about 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter, and the viscosity is a center point. The reason we need these is this is going to determine how much pressure we lose. It's all dependent on the kind of fluid you use. Here we've said a little bit about the capacity. We need 50 tons an hour, which using the density works out to just over 50 cubic meters an hour. And the battery limit pressure my friend needs, this is one bar. Later on we can change this to see how it affects the rest of the design. I've also said a little bit about the pipeline. We know it's 2000 meters. We know that the elevation difference is 15 meters. The minus means we're going downhill. I suppose maybe I could have put that over here, it doesn't matter. And then we need a material roughness. Material roughness is basically the height of the bumps in the pipe and it's specific to the type of material that we use and that will determine how much pressure we lose too or at least have an influence on that. I'm using the standard value for plain old carbon steel. But again, you can change it over here and see what effect it has. Now we need to figure out how big is this pipe going to be? That's the whole point of this line sizing process. Is it going to be a half inch tube? Is it going to be a 24 inch monster? At this stage we can't say, which is why I've chosen a few nominal pipe diameters to have a look at what effect this has. We refer to nominal pipe diameters. What that means is that no, if you took this pipe of say one inch and you started measuring it, you would not be able to find a, a dimension of one inch anywhere. Have a look for example, one inch which is 25.4 millimeters, the internal diameter of a standard one inch pipe is actually a little bit more, 26.6. .6. So it just means around about, that's what nominal is. We also talk about pipe schedules, which is a number that indicates how thick the wall is. The higher the pressure, the higher the schedule number that I will use. The standard 
schedule number for a pipeline is a schedule 40. If I went to schedule 80 piping, it would have a different wall thickness and a different internal diameter. That's, it's the internal diameter we're after here. That's why that's important, because that will determine the velocity. With these internal diameters, which you can find anywhere on the internet, you can calculate a cross-sectional area available for the fluid to flow. And that's important because from that, you'd be able to calculate the velocity of your design flow rate, depending on the pipe size you chose. So you can see that a half inch tube would have a velocity of 70 meters a second. An eight inch, an eight inch pipe would have a velocity of 0.4 meters per second. In my head, I know that if I'm sizing a liquid line, I want to be somewhere around one to five meters a second. This isn't a law, it's just a rule of thumb. If it was gases, it would be something different. If it was steam, it would be something else altogether. I don't want to give you a firm number that you need to stick to because it may change in application. For example, I work with sulfuric acid and there it is typical to keep velocities very low because higher velocities promote corrosion, higher corrosion rates. But for the sake of this exercise, we think it's going to be between one and five meters a second, which gets us somewhere in this range over here the two to six inch range. Right, the next step would be to calculate the Reynolds number. The Reynolds number is a dimensionless number which we love in process engineering. And what it is, is it's the pipe diameter times the density times the uh, velocity divided by the viscosity of a fluid. And if you times those values together, all the units magically disappear and I just get a unitless number. That unitless number tells us something about the manner in which that fluid will flow. Is it going to flow in nice straight lines that don't interfere with each other, that's called laminar flow, or is it going to be turbulent where flow streams are crossing over each other? We're calculating the Reynolds number that we'd achieve for the design rate of 50 tons an hour at various pipe sizes. The Reynolds number, I'm missing an S here, is a number, a dimensionless number, which takes all sorts of fluid properties and tells us what flow regime we're going to be in. Now, one thing you learn is that you go from laminar flow at low Reynolds numbers to turbulent flow somewhere around 3000, 2600, whatever it is. There's a transition zone. Look at these Reynolds numbers. We're talking about way, way higher at the design flow rate. Of course, if the velocity drops, that it will be a lot lower, the Reynolds number, but right now we're only concerned with the design rate. So you can see they're really high. We're dealing with turbulent flow even if we go to a velocity that's lower than that one meter a second that I mentioned. Now that we've got a Reynolds number, we can get the friction factor. The friction factor is the magical number in the front of the equation that's going to tell us how much pressure we will lose based on pipe length, velocity, diameter, and so forth. Now the friction factor, when you learn about it, you're always shown this chart over here. When dealing with process design, you're never reading numbers off a chart. That's the whole point of various equations that have been set up to be able to read this chart and translate it into simple mathematical equations so that you can calculate it. And we've already got enough values over here to calculate the friction factor. That material roughness that I spoke about earlier, that's going to come into play here. We're using the fanning friction factor as opposed to the Darcy friction factor. They're the same thing. One is four times the other. It's that classical scenario in engineering where someone stole something from someone else. I think, I don't actually know that. I'm not trying to slander anyone. We're using the Churchill equation up here, which is good for calculating friction factors above uh, in turbulent flow regimes or above 4,000, something like that. And uh, you, that's where we, we, we lie in all of these scenarios. And here we are, the expression for the pressure drop based on the friction factor. You take the definition of the friction factor, which will have a pressure drop term in it. You rearrange it so that the pressure drop is the subject of the equation and uses the friction factor to calculate. And here I've got the pressure drops in KPA and I've converted them over to bar because I'm most comfortable working in bar. You can see if we started with this half inch tube, we would have 83,000 bar worth of pre That's not gonna happen. We're not using a half inch tube, right? It is simply too narrow to pump through feasibly. In fact, all the way up into about two inch over here, 158 bar, it's a ridiculous amount of pressure to design a two kilometer pipeline to get some water over to a friend. 
I would even say that this 20 bar is a little bit too high. The reason we've got the one to five meters per second is because it gets us to a reasonable pressure drop for a pipeline. The trade-off is lower pressure drop is great. It means that I'm going to save on operating costs because a pump will consume more energy trying to get a liquid to a higher pressure to overcome all of that pressure drop. But the problem with a low pressure drop is it usually means my equipment is a lot bigger, which you can see over here. This eight inch pipeline is going to be a lot more expensive to get me this very low pressure drop. So what I save in operating costs, I lose out on in capital costs and you can start doing economic evaluations. So now we have the design flow rate pressure drops for various sizes of piping. And we're going to go have a look at, I don't like this 20 bar, it's too high. We're going to look at pipe sizes from four inch to eight inch. We don't need to go higher than eight inch because already at eight inch, this pressure drop is so low. So now what I've done a little bit further down is I've selected the four inch pipeline and where previously we were looking at only the design flow rate for various sizes of pipeline, I'm fixing the diameter for at four inches and I'm looking at what the pressure drop in that four inch pipeline would be at various flow rates. So the equations I'm using over here are identical to what I was using over here. It's just I'm varying the flow rate now. So now here I've added in a check that my Reynolds number is over 4,000, which means I can use this Churchill equation to calculate the friction factor. Of course, at no flow, there is no pressure loss. So the friction factor is zero. It's okay that it's highlighted. But if it was read somewhere over here, I'd want to check it out and maybe read off the chart or use another equation. You can see at my design flow rate of 50 for a four inch pipe, I've got this 530 kilopascals, 5.3 bar, which is over here. It's not exactly the same because as we know, this was 50.1 cubic meters per hour. This is 50 cubic meters per hour. That's why there's a slight difference there. Now to get to the magical system curve, which is the curve that describes how much pressure I'm going to lose throughout my entire system at a given flow rate, I need to add two more things. I've got the pipeline pressure drop over here, but I've also got an elevation difference, which means that there's a negative number because we're sitting higher, which is negative pressure drop, right? It's pressure increase by virtue of the fact that we're higher. That's one and a half bar of free pressure drop I can overcome due to my 15 meter elevation. But the problem is my friend wants a bar worth of pressure at their battery limit. So that is additional pressure drop I need to overcome. So I am going to add these three things together at various flow rates. You can see the elevation is constant regardless of the flow rate. And the one bar that my friend wants is also something that I need to fulfill regardless of the flow I'm delivering. So these are constant values. And once I've summed these together, I get the overall system curve over here for a four inch pipeline. And here it is, the mystical system curve for my four inch line. If we start over here, you can see that the, at zero flow, the pressure is minus half a bar pressure drop, which means we are scoring half a bar worth of pressure drop. The reason for that is, once again, we've got one and a half free pressure drop due to elevation, but we lose one bar due to back pressure from my friend. And so we start off at half a bar. Awesome. You can go and change those values and all that it will do is move this curve up and down. Now, the intersection point where my system curve crosses my x-axis, the point of zero pressure drop is how much flow I would get with absolutely no pump. So you can see that if I selected a four inch pipe, I would get 13 cubic meters of flow for free to my friend. Now you understand why I would pump downhill. 13 cubic meters is far away from the 50 that my friend wanted. So you can think of it like this. Imagine this four inch pipeline already existed. Then I'm not going to lay a new pipeline. I'd use what's already there. But what that would mean is I'd need to buy a pump in order to pump through this four inch pipeline to get my 50 cubes to my friend. And I already know that to get that 50 cubes, I would need this pump to give out just under five bar worth of pressure, the, the number that's sitting over here, actually. This is the reason we would potentially need to pump downhill. My pipeline is too small to get the required flow. Now I've gone through exactly the same process for every single pipeline and plotted them next to each other. So here we can see 
A 4 inch pipe would get us 13 cubic meters an hour, as we already know. If we increase to a 5 inch pipe, I don't think I've ever seen a 5 inch pipe, but it is a standard size, so there we go. Um, we'd get about 24 cubic meters an hour, so still not enough. A 6 inch pipe would get us 41 or so cubic meters an hour, so we're almost there. But again, it's not that we physically couldn't do it, this is without a pump. An 8 inch pipe is so big that even at 50 cubic meters per hour, it would arrive at negative 0.3 bar, meaning I would still have 0.3 bar more pressure than necessary. So it would arrive at our friend at 1.3 bar instead of the one bar that they wanted. So this problem can be solved without a pump. I can get 50 tons of water per hour to my friend at a minimum of one bar with an eight inch pipe and no pump. If I selected one of these smaller ones, I would need a pump to overcome that pressure. The discharge pressure of the pump on the six inch pipe, the yellow one, would be very low. It would be less than half a bar. Whereas on the four inch pipe, it would be five bar. The five inch pipe, it would be about one and a 1.2 bar, whatever, I'm not reading very carefully. And this is the entire point of a system curve. This system curve does not care where this pressure comes from. It doesn't know what pump is attached to it. It doesn't even know if it is a pump. The system curve is independent of the device that's supplying your pressure. The system curve says to you, you want 50 cubes of water an hour through this four inch pipe, I want 4.8 bar from you and that's that. The cool thing about this is that we've done this to design a theoretically new pipeline, but I could also use a similar approach to evaluating pressure drops in existing pipelines. An important thing to mention here is that I've said this is for liquid line sizing. The reason for that is throughout all of these calculations, I've assumed that my fluid properties are not changing. So my viscosity, my density, my temperature, all of these numbers up here, they have been constant throughout all the cells. If I try modeling compressible flow, say compressed air or steam or some sort of gas, as, it's as that gas is losing pressure as it flows, its pressure is dropping. And if the pressure drops, the density is also dropping because it's expanding. So the fluid properties aren't constant and we needed those fluid properties to calculate velocity and Reynolds number and friction factor. So you can see where the differential equations start coming in. It starts becoming a lot more complicated because at every point in the pipeline, fluid properties are different. So that becomes a lot more difficult to do.